Well, we come to the conclusion of Jonah. I guess the, the lesson as it particularly applies to us today. We said right from the start that the book of Jonah is a book about the atonement. And the Jews read the book of Jonah on the Day of Atonement, so important is it in that context. And it talks about sin and suffering, and it talks about supplication and salvation. And it talks about the great mistakes that Jonah made. But we also wanted to put that in context, because Jonah was a faithful and a godly prophet. This was a man who had a relationship with God, who had been a successful prophet. And even in the book of Jonah, he's still a successful prophet. He understood the character of God. He knew exactly what God would do. He understood God's character well. He just didn't agree with what God would do. In fact, he disagreed violently with what God would do. He didn't want the Ninevites to receive God's mercy, though he knew that that was what God would do. And he didn't want that because he knew that that would mean that the Jews would subsequently experience God's judgment through the Ninevites. And he was violently against the decision. And so, from Jonah chapter 1, he chartered a boat to avoid the decision, thinking that if he could just last 40 days on that journey, then Nineveh would be destroyed, and he wouldn't have to worry about fulfilling his commission before God. God, of course, had <laughs> other plans, as God often does. And there was a storm, and Jonah was thrown overboard. And it didn't really matter what Jonah did, God relentlessly dragged Jonah back, that he might fulfill his work. And Jonah acknowledged that he'd been saved from certain death, and he made a commitment to fulfill his vow, and he did, beginning in Jonah chapter 3. And he went to Nineveh. And he'd been taken to the point of death before he got to the point of saying, all right, I give in. I'll do what I've been asked. And he went, and once more he was successful. And to his horror, of course, though he knew it would happen, Nineveh began to repent. And he still didn't want Nineveh to repent. And he sat outside the city and waited to see what would happen, hoping against hope that they would change their minds, they would revert to type, and after 40 days, God would bring destruction upon them. And really, it was as simple as it got to at the end of chapter 4, when God encapsulates for Jonah in this little debate that they have, that Jonah's angry at God's mercy for the Ninevites, and then he's angry at God's judgment on the gourd. And what it really means is this. I only want God's mercy on those that I want God to be merciful to. And I only want God's judgment on those I want God's judgment to be delivered to. So don't be merciful to those I don't like, and don't pass judgment upon me, is what Jonah says. He doesn't want mercy on nearly a million Ninevites that he doesn't like. But don't you dare bring your judgment upon me, because I'm important. And you can see the, the utter selfishness of Jonah's position. Doesn't like mercy on the Ninevites, doesn't like judgment on the gourd. It's a completely selfish position. Even though he knew what God would do, and he knew how God worked, and he understood God's character, it doesn't change Jonah's mind about his own needs as opposed to those of others. Which is the lesson that God asks Jonah about at the end of chapter 4. And Jonah knew the answer to that. He just didn't like it. So today what I want to do, brothers and sisters, is, is go through from Jonah chapter 1 through to Jonah chapter 4 because it's a marvellous thread that weaves through all four chapters which concludes the lesson as it applies, particularly for us. To do that, what I want you to do is to to get your notes if you've got them. If you haven't, it doesn't matter particularly. But if you have, it's probably helpful. Particularly, we're going to start on... It's about page three or so. Definitely page three. We're just going to talk about page three and page four. The reason I just want to do this is just to highlight the, the structural element of the book and, and why it's perhaps written like it is and what that means, and then to talk about how that relates to us. We talked briefly at the very start that each chapter has a, a chiastic structure, and sometimes that doesn't mean anything. It's just 
in the same way you might write a letter, Dear Bob, how are you? Letter, yours sincerely, Brendan. That's a classic structure. It starts and ends with a salutation, there's some kind of greeting and conclusion, and there's this stuff in the middle. So a letter that we write is, is a classic structure. Well, in Jonah, sometimes, sometimes through the Bible, there are lots of chiasms which just are like that. There are a few steps repeated, and they don't really mean anything particularly. But sometimes they drive you to a point, and the point is in the middle of the chiasm, and there's a, a reason that it drives us to that particular verse, or the idea of that verse. So I'd just like to go through those, and then we just want to pull out the key verse in each chapter, and then to put those together into the story that they tell. So from verse 1 to 3 of Jonah chapter 1 is an introduction and doesn't form part of any chiasm particularly. But then for the rest of chapter 1, it does. So I've highlighted chapter 1 just in this example and given you more, a bit more information about that. So all that happens is that in verse 4 and beginning of verse 5, the mariners are afraid of this great storm that Yahweh's cast out upon the ocean. And you can see the mirror of that in verse 15 and verse 16 of chapter 1, when it's still, again, the same idea of the mariners and how they're feeling about the storm. So it's the same idea repeated at the start and at the end. The second idea is that they cry to their gods. So therefore the second to last idea is about crying to gods, and they cry to Israel's god as opposed to their own god. And then if you step through bit by bit by bit through chapter 1, you can see that they start as afraid of the storm, they cry to their gods, they try to save their ship, the master goes down to Jonah in verse 6 to try and get Jonah to help, they try and understand why this great storm has come upon them in verse 7, Jonah's asked for an explanation in verse 8, and then the key verse in chapter 1 is verse 9, which is Jonah's confession. And he says before the sailors, I am a Hebrew, and I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. So that's our key verse for chapter 1. Well, then the author's just done the same thing with each subsequent chapter. So chapter 2 is an equally complex chapter, I guess, in terms of the, the number of steps. It begins in chapter 1, verse 16. We said where the chapter break fits better between verse 16 and verse 17. God appoints the fish, and he prepares this great fish to swallow Jonah. Verse 1, in the first part of verse 2, Jonah cries because of his affliction. Then he cries from Sheol, and God hears him. He's then cast into the sea. He's cast from Yahweh's sight. He talks about the temple. He's surrounded by water. He goes down to the deeps. And in the middle part is the first part of verse 6. Jonah is at his lowest point before God. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. And then step by purposeful step, the same structure is repeated in reverse order out to the end of the chapter. In chapter 3, as it is with chapter 1, remember that also sitting in here is a parallel structure with chapters 1 and 2, paralleled with chapter 3 and chapter 4. So verse 1 and 2 of chapter 3 is an introduction in the same way that verse 1, 2 and 3 is an introduction in chapter 1. So the chiasm for chapter 3 starts at verse 3 and goes through to the end of the chapter. So God's judgments announced in verse 3 and 4. People repent, the sackcloth, fasting. Word reaches the king in verse 6. And then at the end of verse 6, there's the confession and repentance of the king. Then word goes out from the king. Sackcloth and ashes again, and Yahweh's judgment is cancelled. So the key part of chapter 3, the king's confession and repentance. He laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and ashes, sackcloth and sat in ashes in the middle of verse 6. And then in chapter 4, I won't go through it again, you've, you've got that here and you can see it in your notes. The key part in verse 4, the central element of verse 4 is verse, or chapter 4 is verse 6 and 7. Where well, Yahweh prepares the gourd, comes up over Jonah to be a shadow, to deliver Jonah from his grief. Jonah's glad, and then God prepares a worm and smites the gourd that it withers. And then the rest of the chapter continues. So what that means for us are four 
key verses to pay attention to. So the question is, what do they mean? And what's the lesson for us? And what's the purpose of these four verses? So it's not just these four verses, verses in isolation. Of course, they, they fit into the context of each chapter. But let's have a little look at these four verses. And then we'll put those four verses in the context in which they exist. All right, Jonah chapter 1. So the key verse is verse 9. And Jonah simply says, I am a Hebrew and I fear Yahweh, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. So it's quite simple what Jonah is saying. This is a sovereign God who's above all things. He controls all things. And in doing so, he creates the heaven and the sea. And you might think that's a reference to somewhere else. If you think of the heavens above and the seas below. It's probably a reference here to Genesis 1, where the waters are above and the waters are below. And God would then take out the dry from the sea. And what Jonah is saying is this is an omnipresent God. He's above me. He's below me. He's around me. God's everywhere present. But he particularly notes that God's above and God's the God of the sea. And out of the sea comes the dry. If you come to chapter 2, Jonah is saying the same kind of thing. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. I'm at the bottom, there's stuff above me, and there are sea and mountains around me. I'm surrounded by these things above me and below me. So as I was in chapter 1, with God of the heaven and the sea, and chapter 2, I'm at the bottom of the sea, and there's mountains and sea around and above me. In chapter 3, the key part is the sackcloth and ashes. Well, where are the sackcloth? What does the, what does the king do? Verse 6. He covers himself with sackcloth, so he's covered by the cloth, and he's sitting in the ashes. So there's cloth above, and there are ashes beneath. So in every verse, Jonah's just saying there's something above and there's something below and something around in chapter 1 and chapter 2, him. In chapter 3, it's the king, covered with sackcloth, sitting in ashes. Well, chapter 4, what's the point of chapter 4? There's nothing beneath, but the point of chapter 4 with verse 6 is that there's a gourd to come over Jonah, to shadow Jonah, to cover Jonah, and then the gourd's removed by the worm. So whatever it was that was over Jonah in chapter 4 is then removed by God in chapter 4. So in every chapter, all the writer is saying is that there is something above and something below, something above, something below, above and below, and then just above and removed. That's the, the elements that Jonah is talking about in each of these four chapters. All right. So what? Well, have a look at this. Chapter 1. Let's start in verse 3. Now, I think the story goes like this. Chapter 1, Jonah confesses before God, and he acknowledges that God is the supreme God with all things, and he, he still chooses to be cast into the sea. Now you can read into that figures of baptism. We talked about figures of sacrifice of the Lord. And just by the way, there was a handout we around this morning, just with an additional slide with Jonah as a type of Christ. We haven't got time to cover it, but it's some quite good Bible marking. The issue, of course, for Jonah was that he's rebelled against God, and Jonah's determining how his sin will be played out. So in verse 3, Jonah rose up to flee from Tarshish. And where does he go? He pays the fare and he goes down to Tarshish. Well, he goes, sorry, let's start with verse 3 again. He rose up the flee of Tarshish from the presence of Yahweh and goes down to Joppa. He finds a ship going to Tarshish, goes down into the ship. All Jonah's done thus far is go away from God. Verse 5, the mariners are afraid, they cry to their God, cast forth the wares, Jonah's gone down further into the sides of the ship, and he's fast asleep. Chapter 2, verse 6, Jonah said, throw me overboard, 
and Jonah goes down to the bottoms of the mountains. And Jonah just goes down, 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 away from God, wherever he can to avoid God. The earth with her bars was about me forever, yet thou has brought up my life from corruption and taken me out of the grave, Jonah says. doesn't matter where I've gone. Jonah knew that he had sinned. He knew what it meant. He knew what the implications were. And he hid. I went down to Tarshish. I went down to the boat. I went down in the boat. I went down to the sea. doesn't matter. God found me. And God was already prepared because God had a fish ready for Jonah. It wasn't quite time for Jonah. And although Jonah was about to die and he felt the prison of Sheol enclosing him, God said, no, no, that's not how you deal with sin. You don't get to decide how you deal with sin. You can't hide and provide your own covering for sin. I'll provide that. And he's prepared a fish. And Jonah's covered by the fish. Though he at first tried to hide in the boat, and he tried to hide in the sea, God says, I'll provide the answer for that sin, Jonah, and you won't. And you can hear in there an echo, I think. We come back to Genesis chapter 3. Because the idea is, I think, clearly the same, and the language is even the same. Genesis chapter 3 Verse 7. As Jonah had gone down to the bottom of the sea, he was enclosed by the prison of Sheol, the grave. He was in the belly of the sea, the womb of the earth. All of those things are true. And he experiences a type of death. One that he had chosen. And yes, he deserved to die for what he'd done. But God determined that's not how it would be played out. Genesis 3 verse 7. The eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And notice this. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh. Well, that's exactly what Jonah had done. He left Jerusalem from the presence of Yahweh and he hid in a boat to avoid his commission for 40 days. Verse 9, Yahweh Elohim called to Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And you know how the story goes in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 Unto Adam also and to his wife did Yahweh Elohim make coats of skins and clothed them, and he covered their nakedness, and he slew the lambs, and he covered their sin, and he decided how that sin would be dealt with. And so, chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Jonah is the story of Adam and Eve, and who sin, and who know that they can't stand in the presence of God for what they've done and they decide how they might deal with their sin. And God says, that's not the plan of salvation. That's not how atonement works. I decide how that works. Coats of skins, fish, it's God's plan. Well, that's chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Jonah. This is Yahweh, the God of the heavens above and the seas below. God's the covering for all of these things, Jonah says. And in chapter 2, when Jonah's in the prison house of Sheol, I'm covered by death and I'm surrounded by water, God says, well, you chose that covering, Jonah, because you're at the bottom of the sea. That's not my choice. And God prepares a fish for Jonah, that God might determine how these things are developed. Well, so chapter 3 of Jonah and the central verse in Jonah 3 is the last part of verse 6. What happens in Jonah 3 verse 6 is that the king repents of his wickedness and because he knows he's been wicked, he covers himself with sackcloth 
in sits and ashes as a covering for his sin. And he knew it was a covering for sin. He knew that he'd done wrong. He said, we've been evil, these people, sackcloth and ashes. But it's different, you see, this time, because well, Jonah chose his own covering in the boat and then in the sea. But the king of Nineveh chose a covering that was relevant. Esther 4 verse 1, for example. Mordecai perceived all that was done. He rent his clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes in Esther 4 verse 1. And he goes out into the city and he cries with a loud and bitter cry, just like they had in Nineveh. There was great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, wailing, sackcloth and ashes in Esther 4 verse 3. So when the king of Nineveh says fasting, crying, sackcloth and ashes, it was absolutely appropriate response to sin, not one that he'd made up on his own. Well, this in Jeremiah 6, verse 26. Daughter of my people, gird thee with a sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation. So entirely appropriate that the king of Nineveh would choose sackcloth and ashes to acknowledge their sin before the God of Israel. And he said in verse 7, of man and beast, Taste, let them, none, neither of them taste anything, not feed nor drink, covered with sackcloth, cry mightily to God. All of the key elements of mourning and lamentation and subjection before God, the king of Nineveh got right. He clearly understood that they were evil, they'd done wrong, and how sin and repentance should be demonstrated before God. This pagan, heathen king. In Matthew 11, the Lord would say, in Matthew 11, verse 21, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, in sackcloth and ashes. How hard is this to understand? If Tyre and Sidon and Nineveh can understand, why can't you? The Gentile had it right before God, so the covering in chapter 3 was entirely appropriate, wasn't it? A perfectly apt covering for their sin. Well, chapter 4. What's with the gourd? And we know Jonah's frame of mind in chapter 4. We talked in some detail about Jonah channeling, if you like, Elijah. He's got the same spirit of Elijah. He wants God's judgment fire and brimstone, fire from heaven upon Nineveh, that they might be destroyed because of their idolatry. And he doesn't want mercy for them. He wants God's judgment on them, but he wants God's mercy for himself. And then he's angry because God, because God destroys a gourd, because that was God's judgment on him. See, and all of that is his selfishness and hypocrisy, and all of those things are true. But God says, Doest thou well to be angry? In verse 4. Are you right in your sin, is what God asks. Angry without a cause, because if you are wrong about that, you're in danger of judgment, Jonah. Verse 5, Jonah 4, he does it. Jonah goes out of the city, sits on the, east, on the east, and made him a booth, and sat under it, in its shadow, to wait for destruction. It's just the same as chapter 1, isn't it? It's just the same as Genesis 3. Jonah made him a booth. They sewed themselves aprons. And Jonah sat under his booth as his covering. Are you angry, Jonah? Are you right to be angry? Absolutely. I will deal with the sin in my own way. And he sits under his own booth that he made for himself to cover his own sin with the booth. Except God was ready for that, wasn't he? Just like God was ready with the fish in Jonah chapter 2. God said, no, no, that's not how we deal with sin in my economy, Jonah. That's how you deal with sin in yours. I'll decide how we deal with sin. Verse 6, And Yahweh Elohim prepared a gourd as he prepared the fish and he made the gourd to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head 
to deliver him from his grief. All the key words of how God talks about sin. And Jonah was exceeding glad of his deliverance and his deliverance from grief in verse 6. And then God smote the gourd. And I think the lesson of the gourd is straightforward but enormously powerful. In chapter 1, God said to Jonah, you don't get to hide in the boat. I am the God of all things. I'm the God of the heaven and the sea, and I brought the dry out of the sea. I own that, Jonah. That's mine to determine how things go. Don't hide in the boat. Jonah says, all right, won't hide in the boat. Or hide in the sea. God says, don't hide in the sea either. That's not how we deal with sin. I'll deal with it. Here's a fish to save you from certain death which you no doubt deserve. I'll give you an example of repentance, Jonah. Look what the king of Nineveh did. Sackcloth and ashes to repent. Why won't you learn? Jonah says, no, no, I just want destruction. I'll sit outside the city and I'll cover my own sin with the booth. God says, all right, I'll give you one last lesson. Another miracle for you, Jonah. Here's a gourd. It'll grow up overnight and cover you. I'll provide the covering. And then Jonah's angry with God because God smote the gourd. Well, what's the lesson of the gourd? And the lesson is simple. If God can slay the lambs for Adam and Eve and take their coats, well, God can raise up a covering for sin and choose to slay the covering for sin, can't he? I'll reserve the right to provide the covering for sin and I'll reserve the right to have that covering killed. Jonah. The gourd is mine. Well, here it is, actually, in Isaiah 53. Let's go there. You know this well. But this is the gourd of Jonah chapter 4. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? Here it goes. Verse 2, for he shall go up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Well, that's the gourd and the barren, windswept edge of Assyria. When God plants this gourd and it grows up to provide a covering for Jonah's sin. No form nor comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty. We should desire him. He's despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And what was it for? We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him. He hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. And I, Jonah, will determine what happens to the gourd and I will kill it if I believe it needs to be killed. And the lesson for Jonah was, of course, the lesson of the Messiah that would come. The covering for sin is God's determination, not Jonah's. And God would raise the plant and God would kill the plant for the education of his servants, for the deliverance of his servants. And this would be God's lesson for Jonah about mercy and about the atonement, that this tender plant that would grow out of the dry Mesopotamian ground would be a covering provided by God, not a covering provided by Jonah from which he could sit and wait for judgment to come upon those he didn't like. We haven't got time to talk about the Lord as the vine, the one we adhere to, the one he says to his disciples after Judas is gone, I'm the vine, don't leave the vine, stay in the vine, stay with me, abide here, And that's the covering, of course, that God would choose to smite when he sacrificed his son. And remember the, remember the worm in Jonah chapter 4? This strange thing. It's translated worm only a couple of times. It's usually translated scarlet. It's usually talking about sin. And the lesson of the worm is, of course, the lesson of the blood. Because the worm is a scarlet that would smite the gourd. And God would say, I'll raise up a deliverer 
and I'll smite the deliverer and the scarlet will be there. And we're covered by the blood of the Lord. And the word prepared, by the way, when God prepares the plant, is the word translated by Isaiah in Isaiah 53 verse 12 as numbered. I'll number this plant, Jonah, because it's my son who we numbered with all of you, but the one that will provide a covering for all of you. So I think, brothers and sisters, the lesson of the lesson of Jonah is quite straightforward. It is a book about the atonement, but there's a wonderful parable of the atonement that runs through the book and the covering that God provides because we can't provide it for ourselves. And the final covering that he reserved the right to destroy in the way that he chose. And I think in terms of application as we, we come to the emblems, there are two. The story of the man who refused Yahweh, who wanted Yahweh to judge the Ninevites for their sin rather than mercy for their repentance, closes with God asking this rhetorical question. Should I spare Nineveh? Well, of course he should. And the lessons, therefore, I think are twofold and they are these. Number one, Jonah wasn't so much better than the Ninevites that he didn't deserve judgment. Number two, they were not so much worse than he, that they didn't deserve mercy. And Jonah had that all out of balance. <coughs> because before God, of course, all flesh is grass, not just the Ninevites. And the Jews aren't any more special than us, except for the fact God chose them. Let's finish on two quotes, brothers and sisters. Come to the Gospel of John. We'll start in John chapter 4. John 4 is the story of the, the Samaritan woman, the woman of Samaria that the Lord meets by the well. And there's this remarkable conversation that he has with her. But he concludes a key point with her in verse 22. He says to the woman of Samaria, the woman of Nineveh, the Gentile woman, the pagan, the idolater, he says, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. It's a Jewish hope. It's a Jewish plan. The Messiah would come from Israel. He would be the prophet like unto Moses. That's the hope, he says to her. If you come back to, Jonah, to John chapter 3, there's a story of Nicodemus. And they're opposites, these two stories. He talks to a man in chapter 3, a woman in chapter 4. He's rich and powerful, she's of no consequence. He's got friends, she's got no friends. He sees him at night, he sees her in the heat of the day. They're opposite stories, the two. And he says to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And to the Jew he said it's everyone else. To everyone else he said it's the Jews. And it's a Jewish hope, but it belongs to everybody. And the lesson of the atonement for Jonah was that it's not just for you, Jonah. And you don't get to determine who's part of the household of faith. I ask you to preach me to the world. You don't get to decide whether you do or don't. I get to decide who's in my kingdom. And I'll call whomever I want. It's your job to do it. And to execute the lesson to Jonah, God gave him his gourd. He said, here's one last chance, Jonah. I provide the covering. I'll sacrifice the covering for your education. 
so that you understand I determine what happens with sin. We've got bread and wine this morning because God's provided the covering for us. He's given us his son, which he slew for us. Because we deserve death, because all flesh is grass. And so the underpinning principle for Jonah was, I guess, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. This is just a question of self-examination. So let's eat and drink and examine ourselves to know the Lord's here soon.